Sure. The standard source is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Global Trends Report. But the most recent report is only updated through the end of 2019. Still, it's quite relevant. At that time, there were 79.5 million forcibly displaced persons in the world, 86.5 million if we included returnees to their home countries, and non-displaced stateless persons. That figure of almost 80 million forcibly displaced included 26 million refugees. Among those, there were 153,300 unaccompanied and separated children. 46 million were internally displaced. And then 4.2 million of that 80 million or 79.5 million number were asylum seekers seeking protection in their new communities. And then of course, stateless, there were 4.2 million stateless persons, some of whom are counted in that number, some of whom aren't. I think the Rohingya are probably the best known stateless group. But there are stateless people in 76 countries. obvious reason, the most obvious reason, is that the conditions that give rise to and sustain these, um, these populations are not being effectively addressed. I mean, that's kind of the simplest explanation. If you think of the major refugee producing situations, whether the Syrian conflict or the South Sudan displacement crisis that followed independence there, the stateless Rohingya refugees fleeing to Bangladesh, Venezuelans fleeing what's essentially a failed state, the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, the Central African Republic, Burundi, the DRC, the terrible humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Think about the uh, Northern Triangle states of Central America, the violence in those states and the lack of viable means of support for people from those countries, the armed conflict in the Ukraine since 2014, and Afghan refugees who have been in Pakistan and Iran now for more than four decades. I mean, many of these situations leading to forced displacement are complex and interrelated. But the truth is they're kind of enduring, you know, and you, some of them reflect the effects of climate change and hunger and poverty and violence and conflict. And all, all of those factors contribute to the situations and contribute to the vulnerability of people that are affected by them. I think, you know, the other obvious reason um, that these numbers keep growing and the forcibly displaced population has doubled over the last decade is because there aren't sufficient permanent solutions for them. More people are becoming displaced year in and out and fewer and fewer are, are, are being given kind of permanent solutions or what used to be called durable solutions. I mean, if you wanted to um, consider refugees, for example, um, over the last decade, 3.9 million refugees have been able to return home voluntarily. 1.1 million have been resettled and 322,400 um, have been able to become citizens in their new host countries. Yet there are 26 million refugees and so you can just see that that's, that's not even making a dent in the number. The, um, the Global Compact on Refugees has emphasized the need for increased private resettlement and, and complementary pathways for refugees, such as family-based immigration, employment-based immigration, student and other visas that they might be able to access. I mean, people like you and I, we can travel, you know, maybe not right now, but generally we can travel, but the people that are and the most need can't. They can't access family visas. They can't access employment visas. They can't access student visas. And that's an obvious durable solution that's just waiting to be pursued. And that's led to a major process, I should say, that UNHCR has created around complementary pathways. 
goes without saying, I think, that the responsibility for refugees and other displaced people is not being fairly shared in the world. 85% of refugees live in developing countries, and 73% of them live in neighboring countries. So, you know, we're not even resettling significant numbers of refugees, but these developing countries are hosting large, large numbers of refugees and forcibly displaced persons, and that's totally inequitable. The coronavirus and state responses to it, which have significantly added to the desperate situations that migrants and refugees are facing, governments throughout the world have imposed entry restrictions and travel bans including on those seeking protection. Many states have imposed new visa and medical requirements for admission. And of course, there's been restrictions on movements in their countries. There's been closures, there's been stay at home orders. And you know, as the International Organization for Migration, which is tracking this, and the Institute for Security Studies and others have pointed out these restrictions um, have basically not deterred and won't be able to deter desperate people from flight. I mean, refugees have to, have, to, have to flee. That's the very definition of a refugee or a forcibly displaced person. However, what they have done is they've exposed them to more irregular and desperate means of flight, whether you know, on lawful streams or through unscrupulous traffickers or whoever, whatever it might be. And, um, and the restrictions themselves have led to large numbers of what are known as stranded migrants, people who can't work, people who aren't wanted, who can't go to school, who are essentially stranded in another country. And uh, to, to provide a sense of this, India has, um, has sought to bring home 1.8 million of its citizens from different countries, workers, international students, various vulnerable citizens. In Yemen, IOM has been, that's the International Organization for Migration, has been assisting tens of thousands of stranded migrants in Yemen, including many Ethiopians. They're subject to being moved around forcibly, to abuse and to predation of all kinds. In Libya, you know, you have conflict and COVID-related mobility restrictions too. The inability to work and hunger have led to many thousand um, seeking to return to mostly African and Asian countries. In Zimbabwe, stranded migrants were abandoned by smugglers because they couldn't get them into South Africa. Um, you have Venezuelans in Colombia, Peru, and elsewhere who have basically, during this crisis, walked, bust, and a few flown home. Um, and many who got home were treated very poorly and have subsequently left Venezuela again. I think the um, maybe it's worth just emphasizing that, like in a place like Libya, you know, the conditions are extraordinarily brutal and. In that country, we're talking about up to 600,000 stranded migrants. They're facing war and trafficking and those in detention, just unconscionable types of conditions. There was a thought that the remittances, the monies remitted home by migrants would actually decrease very significantly as a result of this crisis because lots of people can't work, of course. Um, but actually, um, they're increasing in many countries in 2020, which is a big surprise. Countries like Pakistan and Mexico and Bangladesh, and um, it's not quite clear why this is happening. Obviously, people in those countries have great needs, um, but it may be something as simple as that the, um, the remittances are are assessed by or are estimated by the, the money's wired back. And people may be wiring back more because they can't carry money home, for example. You know, the U.S. since 1980, which was the date that the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, also known as USRAP, 
were was formally created, um, it's resettled three point more than three point one million refugees since that date. Um, and you combine that with the fact, as we've discussed, that there's a record number of forcibly displaced persons in the world. And I, I should say that in many years, probably in most years, the United States had resettled more refugees than all other countries combined, which is this remarkable historic achievement by the United States. Yet we've gone through a period now during the Trump administration of um, them setting extraordinarily low refugee admissions ceilings each year. And last year, in particular, um, we're seeing even we've seen even lower actual admissions of refugees. So, like in 2019, for example, the U.S. continued to admit refugees from, you know, the DRC and Eritrea and Sudan, Ethiopia, and Central African Republic and Somalia, but only 563 refugees from Syria, amazingly, three from Yemen. And the total in 2019 was 30,000 um, resettled, which is which were kind of it's around the numbers in the in the two years after the 9/11 terrorist attacks when the program was shut down and reevaluated. So extraordinarily low numbers in 2019. And the the overall trend, of course, since then has been far fewer refugees from Africa and from Muslim majority countries. In 2020. FY 2020, the U.S. admitted only 11,814 refugees. That's by far the lowest number um, in the history of this program. And for 2021, the Trump administration set a ceiling of 15,000 refugee admissions. And most of the experts that have looked at this have kind of determined that really um, they were only going to admit, you know, maybe 7,000, 8,000 would be possible. So, and, and, and of course, in the first two months of 2021, they've admitted a grand total of one refugee. So um, just to talk about resettlement, you know, it only affects a small number of refugees worldwide, but these are refugees that can't be protected where they're living. And more than three quarters of them are survivors of violence or torture. So they're really the world's most vulnerable people. And what our survey and study found was that this program saves lives, allows people to work, unites families, helps refugees integrate, contributes to the well being of local communities where they're settled, and offers hope to people across the world. And we based this report on a survey of refugees themselves, people um, who are refugee-like people that are populations that are served by that refugee program, and then people that work on the resettlement of refugees, staff, health coordinators, refugee coordinators, refugees themselves and others, volunteers. And, um, and and so we, we felt that this was unique in that way, that we're hearing directly from the experts. And, that what the, and that's what they said about the program. I think what we've also found in our research is that over time, refugees are more successful than the general US population by several standard metrics, which is an, a remarkable thing to say because they come literally with no resources, no money, basically the clothes on their backs. So this program has been a historic humanitarian success. It, that doesn't mean it can't be improved. And I think we identify ways in which the program can be improved in the report that you're talking, referring to. Um, you know, for one thing, the program I think has been somewhat fairly criticized as pushing a one size fits all model of integration that turns mostly on self-sufficiency through early employment. We, th we thought that the program should be a bit more flexible. The fact is, I mean, that different refugees have different needs. Men, women, children, 
torture survivors, professionals, illiterate people, others. There's a there's a wide variety of refugees that come to the to the United States. You can't expect them all to get jobs, you know, within three months and to be on their way to self-sufficiency. They just have different needs at different times. So a, a strong case can be made for a greater emphasis on a case management approach, approach to refugees, um, where their individual goals, needs, and services are kind of aligned and, and there's plans set forth for them at different stages of um, settlement and integration in the country. It's, it's also um, true and a strong finding of the report that the community-based infrastructures and networks that have resettled so many refugees have been significantly dismantled by the Trump administration. More than 100 refugee offices, resettlement offices have been closed you know, out of 325 or something like that. I think it's 125 have been closed. What that represents is a huge loss in expertise in resettlement, a huge loss in community contacts, a, loot, a, a loss in networks that have been working successfully with refugees and with other populations as well across the country. All of these need to be rebuilt, which isn't going to happen overnight. The, pr the program came out very strongly in favor of revitalizing and strengthening this program and argued that it ought to be a major priority for the Biden administration. And as it turns out, I think it will be a major priority for the Biden administration. So that's good news for refugees, but more than that, it's good news for our country. You know, the Center for Migration Studies is a think tank and it produces serious think tank work, objective, fact-based, evidence-based work, but it's also an agency with values. And um, it's an agency found, but founded by the Scalabrini congregation, and its values are rooted in um, the Catholic church teaching, Catholic social teaching, particularly on migrants and refugees, which is, which is very, very powerful. And so um, kind of the, one of the most famous statements of what refugees and migrants mean to the church and to Catholic teaching is the 1952 uh, apostolic constitution called Ex Familia, which um, Pope Pius XII released. And he started it with um, kind of a famous quote. And the quote is, the emigre Holy Family of Nazareth, fleeing into Egypt, is the archetype of every refugee family. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph living in exile in Egypt to escape the fury of an evil king are for all times and all places the models and protectors of every migrant, alien, and refugee of whatever kind, whether compelled by fear of persecution or by want, is forced to leave his native land, his beloved parents and relatives, his close friends, and to seek a foreign soil. So you don't get a stronger statement in our tradition than that. You know, Jesus and the Holy Family are the archetypal refugees. And of course, Pope Francis has been very strong on this as well. His very first trip was to Lampedusa, because of his concern with migrants dying at sea. More recently, um, in December of 2018, he said that Jesus in his family's flight reminds us in this way that half of the displaced people in the world today are children, blameless victims of human injustice. And he said that Christmas calls us to reflect upon the situations of many men, women, and children of our time, migrants, displaced people, and refugees setting out in order to flee from war, from miseries caused by social injustice and by climate change, to leave everything, homes, relatives, homeland, and to face the unknown. 
And in a powerful way, you know, he illustrates how Jesus himself identified with refugees and the stranger. In a quote from 2017, where he said, the presence of God today is also called Rohingya. So in walking with refugees, we live the promise of Christmas 